Welcome to Space Vidcast 235 for Friday the 13th. Dum dum dum. The 2009 <laughs> November, I don't know. I just wanted to do Friday the 13th. I oh, know. Yeah. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is beautiful, lovely, wonderful, talented, and incredible Carrie Ann Higginbotham, who thinks the world is ending. Mm -hmm. Says the end on her shirt. <laughs> and we have got an action packed episode for you today. We've got a live guest in the back half of the show, Robert Godwin from Apogee Books who is the author of the NASA Mission Reports and about, among other things. Among other like things, yeah. Author list is like... <laughs> it's ridiculous. And um, we're going to be talking about Apollo 12 and one of the... Uh, they've got a pretty cool announcement. They're going to be talking about something coming up for Apollo 12 from Apogee, which is going to be really cool. We'll also be giving away these two books, the NASA Mission Reports, Volume 1 and 2. Of and Apollo you, 12. Of Apollo 12. And you can win these if you retweet our show tweet. Is that how that works? Sure. Something like tweet? that. And you can do that on Twitter.com right now. you got to do it prior to, the, prior to the giveaway of the books, of course. Uh, but let's get this show started off right with some space news. Space news. And we begin with the Lunar Rover Sim. Yeah, this is funny. So... Uh, this came out today, and it's something... Today, really? Today? My, that was my understanding. Maybe I'm crazy. No, no, you keep going. I didn't think... Uh, cool. Okay. I'll throw it in the chat room, too, uh, so you guys know what's up. Uh, came out on Apple, at least, and it's a sim for your computer. I, at first, I was kind of confused. I thought it was an app for your phone, and so I was looking for it there, and I couldn't find it, and I was very confused and all this other stuff. But there's lots of people. I saw people were raving about this on Twitter, and I was like, all right, I have to go see what this is all about. Sure enough... It's totally fun and it's totally dorky and you get to like drive around. On we actually have video of this. It's the first one in really? your space news timeline. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I was I was dorking around prior. To check it out. This is me just driving around in the little space sim guy, right over there. And there I am driving on the moon. And unfortunately, our, our yeah our chat room is in the way, so it's kind of hard to see. But, but you do get a map and you do get to you have a target and. It's based off of a lot of what the what they think Constellation will look like when up and ready and done, I guess, and going, I suppose. And you can get different views. You can get the little bubble view. You can get the back view. You can get the overhead view. You know, just like any other video game, I suppose. And uh, you drive all around, and you have different little missions. And it's just, I don't know, it's really kind of cute. It's, just, it's a silly little thing. What they need to do is make some things like that, but like smaller to put on your iPhone or iPod Touch. That would be cool. Because then you would have like little, you know, the movement things. You'd be yeah. like, one of those. So that would be kind of cool. But they don't have that yet. Anyway, so it's a free download. And my understanding is that you can get it for Mac and for PC as well. Cool. Because some people were kind of freaking out about that. But uh, you can, you should be able to get it for that too. And it's kind of cool. And you can see your little tracks. And uh, I actually only played it for the couple minutes it took to get that clip. Because that was me actually playing around in the thing. Mm -hmm. I th can you dock with other stuff? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, because that would be really cool. And it was, I, I got stuck. I actually ran into other vehicles. I, I suck at things like that. That's why they won't send me to the moon. But All right. Yep. Well, anyway. It's a really cool game. It's fun to play. And, you know, when you're playing that at your desk when you should be working and your manager comes by and mm -hmm. they're like, what are you doing? You're going to be like, I'm on the moon. And then you start a conversation about space and maybe you get a new space addict kit out of it. Or you get fired. Yes. One of the two. I, I did mean Windows and PC is personal computer. Sorry. That's great. And I didn't even mean Mac. I meant Apple. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Calm down, chat room. Just saying. Uh, Mission Clock is on sale. Yeah, Mission Clock is on sale. Uh, this is something while I was looking for the Lunar Rover Sim 1.0, mm -hmm. uh, I went to the App Store because, like I said, I thought it was originally... And I searched for NASA, and I found out that Mission Clock is on sale. One of and our favorite iPhone apps of all time. It says for a limited time only. So, And I don't know if that was Jet for me put it on sale, or if iTunes is putting it on sale, or what exactly is going on there. But um, it's like almost 40% off. It's like $3 now instead of whatever it was before. I think it was 5 5 or 7 yeah. or something like that. So if you guys have been interested in it and thought that the price was a little bit high, $3 is actually a lot easier to swallow. 
And uh, it's a great app. We use it all the time. We love it. And it happens to be made by one of the people who frequents our chat room, Jet for me. So, yep. and, and we like it a lot mostly because we get all of our, we, we figure out when launches are happening based on mission clock. So you can see not just the launch time, but all of the milestones for that launch, yep. L minus, T minus, and then each event inside of it. Now, NASA's released their own app that does have a T minus clock built into it, mm -hmm. but that's pretty much it. So uh, right. mi mission clock takes that, if you're a space geek, it takes it to that next level where you just, you can inject all of the times directly into your and vein. And not just the shuttle missions, but like all of the different missions. Like I get lost in there sometimes with all the different things that are going on. And I'm like, what is that again? What? Oh, some satellite is going. I see. So it's it's all of that stuff. And you can get alerts pushed right to your phone, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a really cool thing. And right now it's on sale. So there you go. The end of an era is upon us. Yeah. So 129 it's is about to go up. The it's one of two <clears throat> launches left for Atlantis. Right, and it's the, thank you, uh, it's, <laughs> it's the sixth last mission to go, sixth to last, last? last. I can't say it. Yep. It's one of the last six missions, shuttle missions, how's yep. that? And uh, so because of that, NASA has decided that, unfortunately, it's only people within NASA, but anyone who's ever worked for NASA or worked for NASA on the shuttle program, so in the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. So say you work for NASA, but now you don't anymore, you're retired or whatever it mm -hmm. is, you can still participate there, asking people who work within NASA to create a space shuttle sort of commemorance patch. Mm -hmm. And there are no guidelines other than you have to tell us, you know, you make the patch, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be perfect, just kind of gist of it and what have you, and why these different symbols were important to you. And it doesn't have to be triangular like the shuttle patches. It could be any shape or size and all of that stuff. It's just, so the contest opened a couple of weeks ago and it ends December 1st, I believe, of this year. So coming up. Yeah, and it's great because it's, it's, I thought it was kind of cool. And, and it will be flown and then it'll be made into a real patch and then the winner gets the their, their design made into a patch and they get their design and they get the flown one all in a big, huge placky thing. And I don't know, I thought that was kind of a cool thing that people who have, worked in all areas of NASA can kind of say that they've been part of the shuttle program. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And then, and you know, the guy who's like the janitor can totally just, <laughs> you know, maybe he wins the patch. I scrub the shuttle down when it gets back. I'm making a right? patch. But that's important. All, every single one of those little things is a big deal. And, if you know, we've got NASAites. We NASA didn't have people to do it, then, right, exactly. Yeah, we've got NASAites who join the show. NASAites? Is it NASA is NASAites? NASAites? NASAites. Who join the show and Nassers? watch watch the dailies and the live shows. So for you guys, make a patch and add the Space Vidcast um, rocket in there for me. That would be great. Or the stars, the Space Vidcast stars. stars. The, add the stars. Yeah, add the, add stars. the stars in there. I would, and let just me know. Just a little shout out. It, yeah, just a little, just a little <laughs> shout out. Just a little subtle little mm for Space Vidcast. That'd be great. Oh, that's terrible. Well, that's here's funny. a surprise. You ready? <sighs> it, uh, there's something always wrong with something bathroom related on the International Space Station. And if humans could just learn how to hold it, all of this would not be trouble anymore. The International Space Station urine recycling system is broke. Caution urine. Wait, hang on. Check out this graphic for the, uh, for the, yeah. That's where we went with that. <laughs> <laughs> what? I think that's awesome. That has, that has, first, that would never work in space. Second, I hope that's not the recycling system because is that where you get it out of? Okay, well, that this, that's the problem, you guys. All right, you know, I was looking for <laughs> pictures and I was like, all right, space toilet. It's not like there, any of those pictures are even, they don't even look like toilets, which I understand because they're really kind of not, right? But then on top of that, they don't look cool or spacey or anything like that. Yeah, they look like a room with handles and like, it looks like a weird, contraption. Right. Like, really? And it's not even the toilet part that's broken. It's really the urine uh, recycling the, yeah, part. The caution urine I, part. I, yeah, I keep calling urinalysis. But so, I, it's not like we really, I know, it's not like we have a picture of that other than like that one screenshot that we had that one time from it's like caution urine. months yeah. ago. Right. So you're not going to be able to tell what that is anyway. So that's why I chose that picture because it looked kind of spacey and sort of like a toilet. Point is it's broken again. It's broken. Again, by the way, this is broken before. Do we know what's wrong this time, or is it just no, making there, weird? Last time it was making weird noises, right? Right, and there was a clog that they had to take out. Ew. <laughs> mm, ew. Not something I want to fix in space. I'm your space plumber. Anyway, so that was that month, last month. And uh, they're hoping to have it fixed by the time that 129 launches, mm. because it could get really interesting <laughs> up there. Space nerd, astronauts must wash hands before returning to work. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So, well, the other thing that's, that's kind of an issue is that, okay, so the urine would normally go into the tank to be... Mm -hmm. to Scrubbed both, and right, turned into right? something you can Well, so if, that, if that's not working, and they need to sort of basically drain it mm -hmm. to kind of go through and figure out what's in there, where's all the rest of the urine go? Hmm. So they have to, like, get... <laughs> they have to find, like, extra bags and stuff and, like... Oh, that's oh. fantastic. <laughs> Being an astronaut is not easy, especially when you have to bag your own pee, okay? I mean, it's just... It's wow. so not glamorous. They just need to learn to hold... You know what? Humans will evolve into a species that no longer has to pee. That's, exactly. That's my my. Exactly. Vax said theory. for six months, and I'm saying, yes, please, hold it for six months, and you'll be so much happier. It's not even funny. Three great telescopes, one epic image. This is very cool. This is, if you guys haven't seen this. Check out this picture, actually. It, it's... This yeah. is okay. So this is what they're calling the heart of the Milky Way, and it's three different telescopes. It's a Spitzer, Hubble, and Chandra, and Spitzer does the infrared, and Hubble does the visible, and Chandra does the X-ray, and they put it put all three of them together. And of course, they're kind of colored, you know. So they go, okay, the red is the Spitzer infrared, the Hubble visible. They kind of chose yellow for that, and Chandra X-ray they chose sort of a blue. But when you put those three images together, you get this just absolutely amazing it's it's like galactic tie-dye it's the coolest thing galactic i've ever seen tie -dye. it's very cool and yes it is ginormous it's very ginormous here I'll, I'll put that link in the chat room as well um it's huge so it's yes larry's space porn um it's but it's it is it's so beautiful and mesmerizing to just sort of gaze at and it's one of those things that with each individual telescope we wouldn't get this kind of an image we only get part of that image so it isn't until you bring these three different completely different and huge telescopes that are amazing in their own right and put those pictures together do you get something like this and it's it's really incredible yeah. chat room's mentioning new desktop background yeah I, it's cool although for a desktop background you might lose some of your text because there's a lot of uh, just stuff going on there so i'm, I'm not sure how that will work out, but it is definitely one of those, you know, just keep it in the background and it's it, just a, a really beautiful image. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. It's very gorgeous. When we come so. back, the author of the NASA... Really? I've done that like twice tonight or two uh -huh. or three times. NASA Mission Reports. Robert Godwin will be joining us and we'll be talking about Apollo 12. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome to the Crow River Coffee Company in Watertown, Minnesota. Situated on the bank of the beautiful Crow River, we offer espresso drinks, delicious food, live music, bulk beans, and artisan items. You can see us at crowrivercoffee.com. Thanks.
Welcome back, and joining us live now, we've got Robert Godwin from Apogee Books, who is the author of the Nasha... Really? Three! You're not allowed to three speak times. anymore. Wow! That's just epic fail on my part. The NASA Mission Reports, and we'll be giving these two books away a little bit later on. One of the cool things that Apogee seems to do in, in almost all of them, actually, all the books I think we have from them, is there seems to be, right? So far. Uh, there seems to be associated <laughs> media of like images and audio and video in the back, and these are no exceptions. So there's just a ton, not only are the books cool, but you, you have all the the associated materials right back here on, there's discs there and discs here, so they're really discs cool. Discs everywhere. Discs everywhere. So retweet the show and enter your chance to win and we'll give these away at the end of the show. Robert, welcome to Space Vidcast. How did you get... Hi, good evening, Ben. Hi, Carrie Ann. Hi. How did you get started in all this? Because you, the NASA mission reports, I got at that time, are uh, uh, very large. There are a ton of them, but just like a lot of information there. So where did you get started with all that? Well, you know, it was it was serendipity, really. I was publishing rock and roll books, if you can believe that. <laughs> and uh, I was invited to a dinner in Los Angeles back in 98, I guess it was. And uh, it was to honor the 30th anniversary of the Apollo 7 flight. And I thought, well, that'd be cool. I'll go down to that and meet some astronauts. That'd be neat. So I showed up at the uh, Sheraton at LAX there walked into the lobby of the hotel and there was Buzz Aldrin standing there with my sister-in-law. <laughs> and uh, I recognized him immediately and said, wow, this, that's Buzz. And next thing I know is I'm being invited to sit down for dinner with Buzz and uh, Walt Cunningham from Apollo 7 and Walt's wife and uh, Andy Chaikin, the uh, space author, the author of Man on the Moon. Mm -hmm. So seven of us for dinner. And uh, I'm sitting next to Buzz, right next to him for the whole evening. And uh, after about an hour and a half of listening to him, Buzz said, uh, so what do you do? And I said, uh, I write books. I publish books. And he said, oh, you can do me a favor. And I said, what's that, Buzz? And he said, how would you like to do a book for the uh, anniversary of Apollo 8 in December? So what was I going to say to him? I just said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nah, space what else, isn't you, my what else are you going to say? You know, <laughs> nobody tells so, us all uh, to know. <laughs> so I went down to breakfast the next morning, and Andy Chaikin joined me for breakfast, and he said, "So, what did Buzz talk to you about last night?" I said, "He's asked me to do a book," and Andy said, "Really?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "I have no idea." <laughs> and uh, so, so Andy said, "Well, you know, have you got any thoughts at all?" And I said, "Well, you know, right now the." The press kits for the Apollo missions are selling for upwards of $300 on eBay. Wow. Wow. And it just struck me as being outrageous that people were being charged that much. I figured my kids should be able to read this stuff. Yeah. So I said, you know, why don't I just reprint the press kit for the dinner in Chicago in December? And Andy said, you should add the mission reports to it. Hmm. And I said, wasn't well, that like a stack of paper 25 feet high? And he said, no, no. He said, just these little summaries that they did. So I thought that was a good idea, and so we put the two together, and Mission Reports series was born. And a large series it is. If you look at the uh, ApogeeBooks.com website, it's it's the the list is quite long. You've got it's craziness, and it's anything and everything you could possibly ever want to know about the missions. It's amazing the kind of detail that's there. Yeah, it's well, you know, it's all written by the guys back in the day. You know, it's written by the professional guys that were working on promoting the space program in the 60s. So, you know, my, my task really was just to make sure that we put it out there accurately, that every single digit and every, you know, character and check mark was what it was supposed to be. You get one number wrong and guys in the space community notice. So you yeah. started with Apollo 8, although coming up shortly here this weekend is the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 12 which was the second time humans landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got some stuff coming out in relation to that. I do, yes. Um, one of the things which came my way um, recently, uh, these sorts of things come across my desk quite a lot, where people phone me up and say, hey, I've got something you might be interested in. Well, I had this extraordinary opportunity arrive recently where I got a phone call from a guy saying he had a thousand hours of audio recordings from the space race that he was going to throw away. <gasps> Whoa! And, what? Uh, and, and did I want them? 
And I said, what is it? And he said, well, pretty much anything and everything you can think of. And I said, such as, and they said, well, I don't know, interviews with Ed White and Roger Chaffee and Gus Grissom and, oh you know, the, the, all the management of Apollo uh, and so forth. I don't know, have you, have you still got a video picture there? Uh, well, you in? yeah, we have you, um, although you're frozen right now. So what I'm, I'm tempted to do is uh, we're going to stall for a moment. And Calf, you're Because I wanted to up. show you something. Yeah, hang on one second. So, Calf, hang up that call. We're going to stall for just a moment. <laughs> and then we're going to call you right back. And then hit the video button. And with the magic of Welcome television. Welcome to live TV. It's already done. There we go. There All we right, go. full screen that. Yay! And we've got your video back. Big old, are you seeing me now? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. And moving, too. Well, we can. They can't. <laughs> well, I, I, I can... Uh, I can show you what I was going to show you here, which is yeah. one of these one of these tapes that came my way. Oh Whoa. my God! You're not kidding when you say tape. Yeah, um, you know, and my my big concern, of course, is that these had been stored in a, a very damp environment. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, we thought for sure they had they had mold all over them and everything. This one's been sort of restored at this point, but uh, we thought, okay, well, let's let's see what happens if we play one. Is it going to disintegrate? Right. Because if it looks like it's going to shed, we're going to have to stick it in an oven and bake it and make sure that we, we can save it. Anyway, as it turns out, the humidity that they had been stored in uh, actually protected them because this particular kind of tape is, is more susceptible to, if it dries out, it cracks. So huh. the humidity protected it. Nice. And in amongst all this stuff were, you know, literally hundreds of hours of stuff that, you know, people have never heard before. Wow. Um, so what we found was the uh, first generation audio recording of the P Apollo 12 post-flight press conference. And uh, the thing about Apollo 12, of course, was they had all these various different problems with cameras on that mission. And uh, you may or may not know, but the t television camera, uh, it was the first time they'd taken a color TV camera to the moon. Mm -hmm. And they were they had not actually trained with the TV camera. They were training with a block of wood. <laughs> and uh, so when they got to the surface of the moon, Al Bean and Pete Conrad were really not thinking much about where they pointed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and unfortunately, it pointed right at the uh, sun or possibly at a reflection of the sun off the lunar module. And it melted the tube of the TV camera. <laughs> so all we got of these color TV pictures on Apollo 12 was perhaps you know 20 minutes of decent footage. And then that was it. So when these guys came back from the mission, um, everybody was dying to see the photography that they brought with them because there had been no TV pictures. <laughs> um, and so consequently, they, they arranged, after they got out of um, quarantine, uh, Conrad Gordon and Bean had held this press conference in uh, Houston. And uh, it was taped by this guy who gave me all these tapes. He was there right in the, in the audience with a, presumably a very good tape recorder. Yeah. And um, he taped the whole thing uncut. And uh, NASA, as it turns out, once I got the dates off these tapes, I started digging around and I found out that NASA actually filmed it with 16 millimeter film cameras, not, not with sound. They only used uh, silent film. And they even had the presence of mind to have more than one photographer there so that when one roll of film was running out, they kicked in the next camera. Mm -hmm. So there's an uncut train of, of film footage that, you know, I kept my fingers crossed would match these tapes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I ordered up the film and uh, digitized the tapes and then sort of put the two together on the hard drive to see what would happen. And lo and behold, they matched up almost perfectly. Um, very little tweaking that had to be done to synchronize them. Uh, but what also turned out was that the audio lasts an hour and 47 minutes, uh, whereas the color film footage that was shot only lasts about 50 minutes. And the reason for that was because um, the crew made a presentation, sort of not PowerPoint, but the equivalent slides and film. Right. And so what what I did was I then went back and listening to the audio uh, reconstructed their presentation um, 
So, you know, there's 2,700 still pictures taken on the mission and a lot of color film footage. And uh, what I did was I, listening to what they said, you know, basically rebuilt this presentation. And I'm, I'm reasonably sure it's about 99% accurate to what it is that they showed that day, which, of course, has never actually been uh, kept. Nobody knows what exactly they showed anymore. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, that that was that was the process involved in making this, and and we're putting it out as a DVD uh, this week. And you've got the chat room kind of uh, all giddy. Uh, Vax Headroom says, "Oh my gosh, I'm getting shivers." Well, and they've and been silent for like two awesome. minutes too. Yeah, you've got. Yeah. They're just like in awe right now. <laughs> this chat room. Yeah, everyone at the bottom is like, "The chat room is frozen." No, no, no. Everyone's just They're listening just... to every word you have because it's just really. I mean, what you're saying is. You've got, we've got an event that was seen once live mm -hmm. and then really never again until yeah, it's now. Yeah, never, never been now. seen since. And of course, you know, the thing is, is that uh, um, it's all in the crew's own words and uh, right fresh in memory, as, uh, you know, as Asimov said, in, in memory yet green. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they remembered everything right there and then mm -hmm. because this was just two weeks or three weeks after they, they got home. Um, so, you know, it, it really is a contemporary document of the event as, as told by the crew. And the, and the beauty of it, in my mind, of course, is that Pete Conrad does most of the talking. And, you know, Pete's not with us anymore, which, you know, is very sad. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, his, his tremendous sense of humor comes across. And, you know, perhaps we could roll, you know, one of the clips. I think the first clip, I have no video at my end at the moment, so I can't exactly see. But um, the first clip I think we're going to show is... Uh, Pete discussing the undocking. I think this is one of the best 16 millimeter pictures I've ever seen that Dick took of Intrepid leaving. Uh, we've done our separation and we're waiting for, uh, excuse me, we've done our undocking and we're waiting for Dick to separate and leave us so that we uh, get over on the night side and do our first alignment prior to uh, the descent orbit ejection burn. The first time I looked at this movie, it, it, it looked so unreal to me. I thought if I saw that in a Hollywood movie, I'd say it was a fake. But uh, I was there, and so were Dick and Alan. We'll all vouch for the, the real thing here. As you can see, the way we undocked uh, and hold inertial attitude, we are coming around to the local vertical here where we were looking at each other with the uh, moon dropping down in the background, just coming up uh, for Dick to do his uh, set burn. And that's one of the clips. Uh, we've actually got a couple of clips we could show you tonight, but that's just one of the, what would you say it was like 90 minutes, an hour and a half of... It's an hour time? and 47 minutes. That's a, just a ton of material on DVD that you'll be able to get through Apogee Books. Uh, so we were just, that was the actual undocking. That was live, well, not live, but that was an actual film. <laughs> that would be impressive if that was live. <laughs> uh, that was a film of the undocking. For the Apollo 12 mission, as the as the LEM was undocking. Yeah, it, and you know the the quality of the photography on that is extraordinary. Uh, that's the 16 millimeter Mara camera run by obviously Dick Gordon in the command module there. And um, you know I have seen that multiple times before, but uh, what you what you've just seen there was a, a, a transfer from high definition. So it's actually as, about as good as you're ever going to see it. Um, uh, and you know, until we actually do a Blu-ray disc of it eventually, which we'd like to do. Well, I should clarify, uh, the, the one that they just saw on Space Bigcast was actually not a high-def clip, so when you get the, the DVD from Apogee, it'll actually look a lot better than what you just saw. Although that right was there. gorgeous. No, that was nice, but what you have is better than what we have. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it gets better from there is, is what I'm getting at. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, is that, you know, when, you, when you're transferring all this stuff, you, you're dealing with, uh, you know, really historic and rare materials. And um, I'm, I'm honored to be one of the few people that they will actually lend the film to. Uh, so, you know, when you see some of the later clips this evening, um, you'll see that there are uh, transfers of the crew actually sitting there talking that we did here in-house. Uh, right from the 16 millimeter film and, and when the films showed up here um, they were still sealed in the can I mean they, they were like little library cards in there that nobody had ever written on oh, um, so, now, so you know we should, we should clarify while while you do have an HD capable file the DVD will still be standard definition until you release a blu-ray yes that's yeah yeah, so. yeah. 
it, it's still a bit of a problem trying to do uh, Blu-ray discs at the moment, it's but bit, uh, yes, we, it is. we've been working on that. <laughs> Uh, so we've got, uh, what's, uh, set up the next clip for me. So we, we ju we've undocked, and what do we have next? Okay, well, the next clip is going to be the 16mm uh, camera again, uh, taken from the window of uh, Intrepid, the lunar module, on the surface, showing Pete's first steps onto the surface. And the description is by Albine. Now, these are the movies, and uh, I'll let Al describe them. Uh, he took them... I guess this is the first time that Pete got out and he's uh, getting ready to move over here to the right. You can, one of the interesting things is to watch the way Pete moves. This is pretty much the way it looked too. Watch how slowly and carefully he moves when he first gets out and you do, you feel like you're slightly unbalanced. And before uh, the movie gets much further, you'll see that you catch on real rapidly and you quit moving so slowly and start to jump around on the lunar surface. But right now you're trying to find where your CG is. Look how far forward Pete looks. Yeah, this is a quick break off the flight plan. I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to go see if I could see the surveyor. Hmm. Uh, these are, uh, this is a slide of one of the landing gear pads. And you can see that uh, rod that's moving out sort of at an angle to the left. It's one of the probes that extends down from the foot pad that gives you a, a signal in the cockpit when you're five feet or so above the surface. That was a lunar contact light we called, and Pete shut down. And then you can see from the way it's crushed in there that we really weren't moving fore or aft or left or right with any sort of velocity because it crushed right under the, the pad. If you had been moving very much, it would make a big scar on the surface and then <coughs> fold under the pad. It's not, this isn't the best picture, but uh, you can see the soil under the engine there, and you can see it right around landing gear that it's sort of the top layer of the dust has been moved away, maybe the first inch or so, leaving uh, quite a number of rocks exposed. It, did, it, didn't erode, it didn't erode that pit there or anything like that. You might get that impression it's not. That was pretty cool, too. It's, I mean, it, awesome. it's, it's neat because it's so casual. It's just kind of them talking about it. Yeah, well, I mean, it was their presentation that day, you know, and, and the thing is, is that... Um, you know, I'm trying to reconstruct what they were showing, mm -hmm. but and, the, and there's only so many pictures that they could have chosen from to, to be discussing what they were discussing. So, you know, when he starts talking about the foot pad with the with the probe sticking out to the side, you know, there's only maybe two pictures like that. Right. Uh, so it was pretty easy to go, okay, well, that's what he's talking about here. Later on, there there are uh, some more sort of problematic things where they started talking about photos that they were clearly showing. Um, that they had obviously marked in some way mm. uh, so that people could understand what they were seeing. And so I had to reconstruct those because they didn't exist anymore. Um, and, and, you know, you'll see one of those in a minute. But, um, you know, the thing about this mission is it really gets very little attention anymore. Short shrift, I guess, is the expression. But, um, you know, we, we're trying to do a thing to sort of bring people's attention to it at the... At the uh, Canadian Air and Space Museum, we're doing a screening of this movie on the 18th of this month. And, you know, press have already been asking me, you know, what was the big deal about Apollo 12? You know, what's, what's the pitch? What's the selling point? And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky to explain to people how important it was and how different it was. I mean, these guys were actually the first guys to explore the moon mm -hmm. as opposed to just try and get there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Neil... Um, never ventured more than 50 meters, 60 meters from the lunar module. That was the furthest that any of them went. And I don't know if you saw that extraordinary photograph taken by uh, Elrock this week of the uh, Apollo 11 landing site. Mm -hmm. you, can actually mm -hmm. see, you can actually see Neil's footprints going out to Station 5, which is, you can see, he only went 50 meters. Mm -hmm. Apollo 12, you know, those guys, they actually went over the horizon. When they went to Sharp Crater, the LEM disappeared over the curvature of the uh, of the lunar surface, and they really felt like they were out out on a limb, you know, exploring. So uh, that was one of the principal things that people forget about Apollo 12 is that these guys actually went there to do science as opposed to just seeing if they could get there. Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue all the Apollo missions, even whether they went to the moon or not, were important, but especially 
from 11 to 17 where they actually, that, that's it. That's the only time humanity has ever stepped foot off this planet down onto an alien body ever, ever. So you can't just say, well, Apollo 11, we stepped foot on the moon for the first time. Everything else doesn't matter after that. I mean, imagine if yeah. Columbus came to the New World, stepped foot on America, and we never came back. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, I mean, Lee, so, like, like Lee, Lee Ferrickson. <laughs> exactly. So it, it, it all counts. I mean, it, it all matters. It, it's, it's all and, very and, important. You know, the other thing about Apollo 12 is, oh. is you know, you, people forget some of the extraordinary things that happened during that mission. Uh, on the film, on the DVD, one of the first things that, that Pete talks about, of course, he starts the presentation and he runs a little 20 second or 10 second clip of the launch and he says, uh, Apollo 12 was a pretty routine flight for the first 36 seconds. And, uh, and then, of course, he starts talking about the fact that the, uh, the um, booster got hit by lightning twice, right after launch. And the other thing which you know, people don't even talk about anymore is the fact that the, the command module on Apollo 12 had what's called the boost protective cover over it, which was this sort of cone to protect it from the elements mm -hmm. that was attached to the launch escape tower. And it was raining so hard right before the launch of Apollo 12 the water had actually got underneath the BPC and was actually filling up the nozzles of the, uh, uh, of the reaction control system with water. And, and, you know, Pete was concerned that it was going to freeze and then their, then their uh, RCS system wouldn't work once they got into space. Um, no sooner they took off, they get hit by lightning twice. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the complete platform dies. Every light on the board comes on, on for a second and then everything goes off. And, and, you know, Conrad's sitting there with his hand on the abort handle, and he said, you know, it just kept chugging along, so I left it alone. <laughs> and uh, they had, he said that, you know, if they had a problem, he figured it would be something that they'd never trained for. And sure enough, it was like almost a catastrophe. And can you imagine today, I mean, when you see the Ares uh, 1X or X1 or whatever it's called, that thing that they launched a couple of weeks ago, they didn't dare launch the damn thing because there was a cloud within 10 miles of it. You know, Apollo 12, they launched with three guys on it right. in a lightning storm. Right. You know, I mean, well, sometimes well, that's no glory. You know? That is an interesting culture change in NASA because they had to, they had to get around launch. I mean, they, they weren't supposed to launch in a lightning, in any storm. I mean, there is launch commit, launch commit criteria that says don't do that. And they were like, yeah, do it anyhow. And, you know, you get that yeah. today, and they're like, wait, hang on, I think there's a minor breeze approaching. Scrub. Yeah, and, you know, when you, th you think about the edge that these guys were riding on, uh, you know, once they got into space, the ice that had been underneath the BPC had actually um, mm -hmm. fogged up the windows so badly that when Dick Gordon first looked through the sextant to try and, the periscope and the sextant, to try and get a position fix, he could see absolutely no stars at all. And that really worried them for a while there because, uh, you know, you can't do a lot of guidance in those days without being able to fix on at least one star. Right. And eventually, they, they, the only star that they could find was Sirius. And he had to get Al Bean to spot it out the window for him and tell him when it was coming into view uh, so that he could get a, a platform fix and uh, start navigating. I mean, just imagine them doing that today. You know, iced up windows and no platform. <laughs> uh, let's set up the uh, third clip that you've got for us. Okay, yeah, the third one is uh, is the beginning of the the post presentation um, uh, press conference, I believe, and uh, it's a question and answer thing. And I thought this was a really cute example of Pete's sense of humor. Um, this is a reporter asking him about. Um, issues of, of metaphysic metaphysical questions <laughs> the Apollo 10 and the Apollo 11 teams made so much out of spiritual matters and scriptures that it caught the attention of Mrs. O'Hara the atheist and her followers and also made it noticeable in the way probably that you gentlemen didn't and I was wondering and some others have been wondering if there's any pressure put on. And since you return, has there been any attention or attempts of attention calling your attention to that matter? Uh, had it done any good to say, God bless Mrs. O'Hare up there, I would have done it. However, I...
However, I feel all it would have done was serve to give her unwarranted publicity through the press, and therefore uh, I think uh, we reacted not under any pressure and had any of the other crew members desired to say anything up there that was well within their right and uh, had we needed to take leave to be on our personal time up there or something, well, I'd have been glad to grant it as skipper of the crew so they could do it. I also don't really think you have to speak up publicly to indicate your belief in God or Christian activities. That's uh, a typical example of Pete's sense of humor. There's some more really good ones in there. He, he, was, he was a riot. Yeah, they clearly had a lot of fun with it. You know, just the like I said, it was a very it felt like a very casual conversation, not nearly the normal, very strict and you know orderly. Well, yeah. Now it feels like any time that an astronaut says anything anywhere, that it feels as though whatever they say has gone through a committee of people to be okayed for them to say it, or at least through PAO at one point. Right. I mean, that just felt a little bit more off the cuff. And, much more human. Much more fun and human. Yeah, absolutely. Human. Yeah. In amongst these tapes, there was a lot of press conferences from earlier missions. You know, there's, I've got press conferences here from the Gemini program and wow. uh, even going back to Mercury. There's, there's even speeches by Kennedy that I've never heard before. And um, when you listen to the Apollo 11 and even Apollo 10 press conferences, you can tell that there's got to be, you know, several hundred journalists in the room all buzzing and trying to get their hand up and get their question answered. And... Uh, this press conference, you know, post Apollo 12, surprisingly, you know, it looked like there was only maybe 50 or 60 people in the room, uh, which may be, you know, a reflection of that sort of mentality of, of being uh, slightly less interested, the public slightly less interested at this point. And, you know, I put that down to, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the TV pictures just didn't really come back. Mm -hmm. Although having mm -hmm. said that, they, you know, the crew were proud of the fact that they hosted the first um, space press conference and that was something that the crew themselves had decided that they wanted to do and on their way home from the moon they they hosted a press conference from on board the command module That's very and, that, cool. and that was broadcast back in color and that was that was the beginning of that whole trend of where you now see you know nine guys in ISS all floating in a circle mm -hmm. that all, all began with the Apollo 12 guys uh, what, the, the chat room has a question, which is a good one. Are there any plans to put the audio recordings out on a DVD data disc or a CD data disc, just as data audio files that you can maybe bring into your iTunes or something like that? Yes, there are, and, that, and that's about all I can say about that right now. There's, <laughs> there's, right. there's, there's plans to do uh, a lot of stuff with, um, you know, more, I don't know, what you would call modern media, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we, mm -hmm. we have so much material here that, you know, it really doesn't exist anywhere else, whether it be uh, video, film, audio, 3D stuff, um, you know, wireframes, um, and God knows how much text, you know, going all the way back to 1600s, if you can believe. Oh my God. You know, we've, we've got access to documents, uh, you know, going back to Kepler and Copernicus's time that, you know, I can't find online, and God knows I've looked enough. Wow. So we have, we have plans to make a lot of this stuff available. It's, you know, We've made a business out of doing this for over a decade now, and you know you're accumulating this stuff, and you're actually paying money for it, um, and trying to make it available to people as fast as you can, as affordably as you can, mm -hmm. and in, you know in a friendly format. But it's a real challenge, you know, to try and do everything that everybody wants. I'd love to just be able to Twitter the whole thing, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> That'd be a massive account. <laughs> Apollo 12 and 140 characters. All right, let's move on to the next clip. Set up uh, clip number four for us. Okay, uh, yeah, clip number four is, um, it begins with some rare video footage of the splashdown and uh, um, goes into Pete describing what happened immediately after splashdown, uh, which is where the 16 millimeter movie camera decided to attack Alan Bean. <laughs> it's a good story, check it out. Uh, in the same area, it's in near the ocean of storms, uh, Eratosthenes. I just wanted to show you this because I think it happens to be one of the prettiest pictures that we got from lunar orbit. It's just a beautiful thing to look at.
We thought okay, we'd pass this, that on to you right here. This is for Apollo 13. This is the... Oh, I got the wrong clip. One of the pictures we took That's with an 80 right. millimeter uh, lens. Half, the the, the morning of thing. our lunar landing, we call that DOI day, or landing day, or whatever right, you want to call it. We're going to swap it out. But I apologize. The, there you go. This is the clip. Everybody gets excited kind of about stable, writing. too. That's uh, not a bad position to be in, but uh, it's a rather straightforward how you get there. You don't get the shoots off in time. And uh, Dick, of course, was in the left seat, and I was in the middle, and Al was in the right. And uh, if you notice those pictures, you'll see the bottom of the spacecraft is rather flat in several places because we had exactly the right combination of wind and, and uh, sea so that... Uh, we had one whale of a impact on landing, and uh, the 16 millimeter movie camera flew off and, and uh, hit Al right in the head. It uh, it stunned him for about five seconds, which was just long enough for for the uh, wind to pull us over into stable too. And Dick, of course, being over in the left, couldn't see the camera hit Al, and he was over there hollering, "Push in the circuit breakers! We're going over in stable too!" And, and Al was completely out to lunch. He was over there, and he finally, <laughs> finally came to in about five seconds, and he ducked the camera very slowly, which had already gone by five seconds earlier, and reached in, pushed in the circuit breakers, and he says, what the heck are you in such a hurry for? I got up as fast as I could, so uh, <laughs> I guess maybe that was the only anomaly we had on that part of the flight. I thought he was behaving like a rookie, but I'll guarantee one thing. Captain Bean is no longer a rookie. <laughs> Yeah, he learned the hard way, though, uh, the first two hours into the flight, we made him hold all the equipment. And then he said he knew why you took rookies along to hold all the gear. <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's, uh, sorry I, I, I picked the wrong clip there. But yeah, that, that, was, that was the clip I meant to describe. We, ha we have one more, which was actually during the mission. And that was, uh, I guess, clip number four on, on our list. And uh, this one is, is part of Dick Gordon's um, job was to photograph future landing sites while he was in orbit around the moon. Yeah. That was one of the primary objectives for Apollo 12, was to shoot these pictures of landing sites. And this was an example of where I had to go through God knows how many different pictures, trying to find the ones he was talking about. And specifically, uh, he was shooting a lot of images of Frau Moreau, which was, which was planned to be the landing site for Apollo 13 and of course ultimately became the landing site for 14 and uh, not only was he talking about here's a picture I took of Frau Moreau but he was describing which lens he used <laughs> so, I had to, so I had to figure out which was the 80 millimeter lens picture and which was the 500 millimeter lens picture and then and then reconstruct the approach path and, and the landing ellipse and so on and so if, if we run this clip you'll see uh, Dick doing part of his presentation about his orbital photography uh, in the same area, it's in near the ocean of storms, uh, Eratosthenes. I just wanted to show you this because I think it happens to be one of the prettiest pictures that we got from lunar orbit. It's just a beautiful thing to look at. We thought okay, we'd pass this, that on to you right here. This is for Apollo 13. This is the one of the pictures we took with an 80 millimeter lens. The morning of our lunar landing, we call that DOI day, or landing day, or whatever you want to call it. But it illustrates, and I'm sorry that it's not a little bit lighter on this particular projection, but the, oops, I'm sorry. Okay, the arrow here is to the north, and here is Apollo 13's landing site. The line coming in from this, in this direction is their approach path to that particular site. An illustration of our high resolution photography. This is taken with a 500 millimeter lens. The ellipse on the right hand side is the Apollo 13 landing zone in Fra Mauro. It's pretty cool. That's so cool. The, uh, the little tiny crater that you can see to the left of that ellipse, that's Cone Crater. Which was the uh, which was the the bane of Shepard and Mitchell's existence when they finally got there. Part of their job was to try and climb Cone Crater because it looked like a volcano. Mm. And um, mm. what was interesting was going through the Apollo 12 still photography to recreate this. 
um, I found all these different pictures that Dick had taken of Frau Moreau, and some of them were taken at a very low approach angle uh, as, as Frau Moreau was coming over the horizon. And you could see that cone almost as 3D in some of those pictures. It's really neat mm. to actually finally see Cone Crater and see why they called it that. <laughs> well, what's interesting is, as I understand it, when you're on the moon, because there are no features, there are no trees, there are no, I mean, anything, it's just lunar surface, uh, s the scope of what you're looking at, you, you don't know if you're, looking into a, if you're looking up at a mountain or if you're looking down at a giant crater, y you don't know how large it actually is until you either try to start to climb and realize, oh my gosh, this is as tall as Mount Everest, or fall to your death. And yeah, well, that was, that was something that, that they experienced on this mission, was that they, had, they make some comments about wanting to go and investigate some boulders that they could see near the horizon. And uh, they were getting ready to walk out there and take a look at these boulders, and, and the ground told them, uh, give it up, guys, they're six kilometers away. There was just absolutely no concept of distance. Right. And what's interesting is that 12 had a very difficult time with the landing because of the uh, amount of dust that was kicked up uh, just before landing. Pete literally landed blind just about. Hmm. And um, it, if it wasn't for the radar altimeter, uh, landing on the moon really would have been just about impossible because you just have no depth perception whatsoever. And what's interesting is that you know Arthur C. Clarke um, first suggested that a radar altimeter would be needed to land on the moon. And he suggested that back in the 50s, hmm. uh, 50, 51 or something like that was when he suggested that. So it was kind of a neat prediction by Arthur. It, one of the interesting things is that um, they nailed their landing. You know, with, with uh, Apollo, uh, I'm trying to go back. Apollo 11, they actually, he had to s slide over his landing site a little bit because there were some boulders there or there was something there he, he didn't like. And so he, yeah. he, he missed. But Apollo 12, they like nailed it, didn't they? I mean, they were like, they may not yes. be able to see it, but they, they just nailed proved it. proved their precision landing technique. Yeah, well, it was, a, it was an entirely different approach uh, to, to what Apollo 11 and Apollo 10 had used. Um, they had decided that they wanted to try and do this pinpoint landing because. Well, that was one of the primary objectives. Again, Apollo 12 only had, I think, four primary objectives, and one of them was landing right where they wanted to land uh, because they obviously wanted to get as close to Surveyor 3 as they could. And so uh, I believe what they did was, a, was an entirely different kind of an approach that sort of almost looped upwards and then tipped over. Hmm. And if you watch the, if you watch the film of, of the landing of 11, um, which is available on Apogee DVD, okay. uh, um, you know, there's 14 minutes of film there. Buzz turns the camera on, and, and the, the camera runs for 14 minutes from engine ignition right to touchdown. Mm. And, and there's pretty much something to see the whole time. On 12, they didn't even turn the camera on until seven minutes before touchdown because there was nothing to see because of their attitude. They were basically looking at sky mm. the whole time mm. until seven minutes before. And when they started to finally come down, um, I think Pete was as surprised as anybody. You can hear it in his voice. He was astounded that he was right where he was supposed to be. He could see the uh, snowman configuration of craters, which was like three craters that looked like snowman, you know, in your front garden. And, uh, and he could see Surveyor Crater, and he was just bubbling with excitement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were told to land within uh, no closer than 500 feet to the Surveyor, because they didn't want to spray it with contaminants. Mm -hmm. And so he landed 600 feet from Surveyor. Uh, and he said, you know, I really couldn't have got much closer. He, he was 100 feet outside his, his, his landing ellipse. And uh, of course, then they walked over to the Surveyor and cut pieces off it, which was, which was one of their secondary objectives. Now, we're on the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 12 moon landing, launch landing, and safe return which means that we're only a couple of years away from the 40th anniversary of humans' last stepping foot on the moon. And we haven't been back since. And while we do have plans and constellation to try to go back to the moon, that's all up in the air. The Augustine Commission has said you, you can't do it with your current budget. You know, there are a bunch of different vehicles. So in your opinion, will we be going back to the moon? And if so, when? Well, you know, I, I'm not an expert on these things, but... It seems to me, you know, you can't help but absorb a lot of this sort of from osmosis, from editing. 
you know, all these wonderful writers' material. I mean, I'm working on a book right now that's written by Rusty Schweikert, Peter Diamandis, J uh, Pulitzer Prize nominee Joe Pelton. You know, I mean, these guys are brilliant people, and I'm reading their stuff for a living every day. Right. So, so you kind of you're getting all these different perspectives, and and you know, hopefully, I've got enough IQ to be able to figure out what makes sense. But it's one of the things that really leaps out at me is that every successful NASA program up to now, manned program, whether it be Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, or the shuttle, was backed by DOD money. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Atlas booster, the Redstone missile, the Titan, even the Saturn were all military programs, and so was the shuttle. They all got huge injections of funds to make them man safe and capable of doing what it is that they ended up doing from the Department of Defense. And NASA kind of rode on the back of that. And here they are today now with this static budget, which, you know, in actual real terms is actually going down mm -hmm. and, and being told to create a man rated heavy lift launch vehicle with a diminishing budget and, and no input really from the Department of Defense. And so, you know, it seems to me that if you've got some big heavy lift military boosters out there right now, doesn't it make more sense to just man rate them than try and build one from scratch? That, that's just my opinion. Well, then there's always the question of why even go back to the moon at all. We put humans on the moon. We saw what there was to see. Why not move on? Why not just skip the moon, go on to Mars? Why Mars at all? Why, why even do human exploration? Robots can do it. Well, boy, it would have been nice if we could have found... Uh, you know, ice there at the uh, at the South Pole, um, something which even Robert Goddard suggested might be there. You know, it would have been great if, the, if that impactor had actually, Elcross had actually sprayed up ice everywhere. Uh, it would have made it a lot easier. And then, of course, then you've got a lot of logic. There's much better logic for going there then because the gravity well is so much shallower. And, uh, you know, if you if you can make your fuel and your oxygen and your water and everything on the lunar surface and just throw it into space with a, with some kind of rail gun or whatever. Um, it's a hell of a lot easier than trying to dig your way out of the Earth's gravity well. But I don't know, the results that I've seen seem to suggest that, you know, there isn't a whole lot of water there. So, you know, there seem to be valid arguments from both sides. A lot of people who are all for going to Mars, like Bob Zubrin, say, you know, training on the moon has will bear very little fruit because... It, it's an entirely different environment. The soil behaves differently when it gets into the joints of the spacesuits. Um, there's no magnetic field at all on the moon, although they think there might be a little one on Mars. There's a slight atmosphere, and, and Zubrin talks in great detail about how the, uh, the atmosphere of Mars is the equivalent to X number of feet of aluminum shielding, which the moon has none of. So if you're going to be on the moon training, you better be sure that you can be there when there's not going to be, you know, a, a, a high solar activity, which really means digging in. You've got to sort of bury your moon base. Um, it's it's a real problem. I mean, if you're going to go to the moon to stay, you better know that you can be in a place where you can get away from solar storms. So, you know, if you're going to go into that permanently shadowed crater on the on the South Pole, great. If there's a solar storm, you know, you're not in the in the line of fire. So, you know. Going back to the moon, it's a great training ground. It's a lot closer. It's only three days away. If somebody gets in trouble, you get home in three days. Um, but there are technologies in the pipe, I think, um, that hold great promise for getting to Mars quickly enough that you might be able to uh, avoid the hazards of cosmic radiation as well. So it's a real, it's a tough call. And there are a lot smarter people than me trying to figure out which is the right way to go. Well, it's it's a constant battle for. Well, I mean, the space nerds are all like, "Do it all! I don't care!" Uh, right? I mean, we're like, well, "Go to the moon, great. Go to Mars, great. Whatever. Just you know, throw humans somewhere." Um, and, you know, well, you know, if you go to Mars, you, you know, you the best. The, the sort of laws of physics make it pretty difficult to get there any quicker than I don't know, twelve to eighteen months anyway, unless we change our propulsion systems, and. Um, like I said, there are things that people are working on. I don't know how many of your your um, viewers have heard of the uh, Bassard Polywell Wiffle Ball Reactor. Um, it's something which I just came to my attention fairly recently. 
but it's a it's a device for electrostatic fusion that Robert Bassard was working on just before he died. And um, if it works, and at the moment they're saying that there isn't much in the laws of physics to suggest it won't work, they're talking about be, being able to build a fusion reactor that would be able to propel a manned vehicle to Mars in 30 days. And uh, it's it's got no neutron flux, so there's no radiation to deal with. Um, it's It operates on um, ionized hydrogen and uh, boron-11, uh, which when, it, when the two fuse together, they create carbon-12, which decays into helium. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes straight to power out. There's, there's, uh, it's just an extraordinary thing if they can make it work. And um, holds great promise. It sounds like something straight out of Star Trek, but yeah, the Navy's Trek, financing yeah. it right now. And the Navy's the Navy literally about six weeks ago just gave them another eight and a half million to work on it and with an option for another four million in the next couple of months. And they're building the seventh iteration of this reactor right now and, and they're saying if they can build the ninth version of it, um, it will be a commercial fusion reactor that uh, would power a city the size of Chicago in a, in a, in a volume the size of uh, your kitchen. That's quite incredible, actually. That has applications well beyond space travel. I mean, yeah, that could oh, revolutionize absolutely. the humans as we know them. I highly, highly recommend that uh, you know your viewers just just uh, do a Google search on "Should Google Go Nuclear," and watch uh, Robert Bassard's presentation that he gave just before he died to Google, where he describes this thing. Uh, it, it's the most promising thing I've seen in years. And um, I, I have to say, those sort of things lead me into other areas. And I sent some questions out asking about this thing. And it turns out that it was based on uh, a thing called electrostatic fusion uh, reactor built by a guy called Robert Hirsch and Philo Farnsworth. Philo was the guy who invented television. Mm -hmm. And um, Robert Hirsch is still with us. And when I sent these questions out to a couple of people, a couple of days later, I was getting emails from Robert Hirsch <laughs> and uh, asking me, you know, why was I asking questions about the Bassard's reactor? And I said, well, I don't know. It just caught my eye. It sounded amazing. And he said, uh, well, you know, uh, I hired Robert to, to, to build the thing. And, I'm, and he said, I'm the, I'm the chairman of the Navy committee that's overseeing it right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> So I'm now, I'm now uh, this is the first announcement of this. This is, this is the first time I've told anybody this publicly. We're going to be publishing Robert Hirsch's book. Um, he signed up with us about uh, a month ago. And in 2010, we're going to be publishing his book about fusion, fission, uh, geothermal energy, solar, space-based solar, oil, coal. He's the world's leading expert on energy. Wow, so, that sounds uh, amazingly awesome and like something that, like I said, could forever change humanity, yeah. just to put it mildly. Right. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Of course, you know, the implications for space travel are ridiculous. They're talking about being able to get to the moons of Saturn in seven weeks. <laughs> Although, we, we, and eventually we're going to run into an inertia problem, aren't we? Because while, while there's no gravity, you still have the force of the vehicle slamming into you as it's accelerating. So you can only accelerate so fast before you're plowed against the back of the thing, right? Yeah, well, they did a lot of studies on 1G acceleration back in the 60s. And another one of our authors wrote about this in his book, um, Getting Off the Planet. It was a guy called Dr. Randall Chambers. And he, he, he was the doctor who trained the Mercury astronauts, um, did all their medical stuff. And he wrote about that, how they did these experiments in the early 60s, where they put a guy in a centrifuge at 1G and just kept it running for like three days just to see... <laughs> How, how he could cope with it and then they I think they even cranked it up to two G's and and just you know kept this thing just going at two G's for days at a time and you know I'm sure the guys weren't too happy about it but they survived it um, would you be you know, if you were stuck in a thing for, for with two G's for like three days straight would you be like that was awesome let's do that again you know what though, uh, I, I, I feel like bathroom to... bathroom no 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 but half of our chat room is like me me I'll do it I'll do it <laughs> Like, I'll be a guinea pig, no problem. <laughs> well, you know, that was another conversation I had. I talked to the, um, the chief biologist in, at uh, Johnson Space Center. I was down there a while back having lunch with these guys. And, you know, you don't get too many opportunities to sit down in the canteen and face off with the head guys right. in, charge of, you know, in charge of that department. And I just looked them straight, straight in the eye over their pizza and said, come on, guys, what's the deal? Why aren't we going to Mars? 
And uh, without missing a beat, both of them said the same thing. They said, look, we could go to Mars. We could do it right now. But it would be a one-way mission right now. And I said, well, what do you mean? They started getting into all the issues of cosmic radiation, solar flares, and everything else. And so I threw out all the different proposals for you know, bomb shelters in the middle of the spacecraft surrounded by water or aluminum or artificial magnetic fields and all this kind of thing. And they said, yeah, 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 all these things, we could do some of them, you know, some of them we can't do yet, but we could do these things and it would all attenuate the effect and it would make it safer, but it would still probably be a one-way trip. And then he said, uh, however, what astounds me is that if they put a thing up on the bulletin board here today saying, we're looking for volunteers for a one-way trip to Mars, he said the list would fill up in a day. And he said, these are not crazy people either. And he said, I still haven't got my head wrapped around that yet. He said, but there's a whole bunch of people here who'd sign up for that one-way trip. Well, there's something in the, well, it's interesting. We actually had a post similar to that on Space Vidcast asking that very question, would you take a one-way trip to Mars? And the consensus generally was, yes, absolutely. Most people, not all of them. And uh, it was, I think there's something in the human spirit that wants to explore. Uh, uh, we're running out of time for the YouTube limit. So what we're going to do really quick is, if you've got a few more minutes, I'd love to continue this conversation in post-show. But we do have to give away uh, your, and I don't want to give them away, I want to keep them. The uh, Apollo 12 NASA Mission Reports, Volume 1 and 2. And uh, what's the number we have to go up to here? 14. All right, pick a number between 1 and 14. Uh, 4. 4. The winner is. Do you think this is easier? Four. Quark Spin. Congratulations, you have won these two books. We'll get your details after the show. Uh, if you can stick around for a few more minutes, we'd love to continue the conversation and uh, uh, make that available to some Epic members as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, quick note, we will not be live next week as Karen and I will not be in the state. We will attempt to give you live STS-129 coverage right here on spacevidcast.com. However, we're going to be leaving when? Thursday? Something like that? Yes. So if it delays, this is going to be interesting. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to work that. But regardless, somehow, some way, But you'll see sure because it's on NASA TV. You just may not see you us. You may not see us, but somehow, some way, you will get high definition coverage of it right here on spacevidcast.com the only place to get high definition coverage of shuttle launch events on the internet uh, whether we're able to do the extended stuff for 129 i'm not sure we're going to make every effort to make that happen i do have my shirt though <laughs> we have this right uh, so uh, and another note uh, we will not have the live space vidcast next week so we will see you two weeks from now i'd like to thank everyone for joining us and we'll see you guys in two weeks <laughs>